Hey, what's up guys? So I want to do a little video here about a debate between Robert Coons and uh, Dr. Jordan Cooper uh, that was on Sue Ann Sona's uh, YouTube page called Intellectual Conservatism. If you want to check it out, uh, Sue Ann Sona, he's good on the papacy. Um, he's a good uh, amateur scholar on the papacy and his YouTube channel is called Intellectual Conservatism. And that's where you can find this debate between Jordan Cooper and... Uh, Robert Coons, and they actually did debate, which is pretty cool. Um, so my comments are, are about uh, faith alone and Romans 4. So at the beginning of the uh, debate, Robert Coons says that uh, he does not think that the church fathers say that uh, justification is by faith alone. Now, consistently throughout um, this conversation, uh, Robert Coons seems to confuse uh imputation and faith alone, or at least conflate imputation and faith alone, because uh, there is a Catholic faith alone, and there is a patristic faith alone that is good and necessary uh, for us to, to affirm, um, but it doesn't include imputation, and we can distinguish between imputation and faith alone. Uh, in fact, you could probably even come up with a form of imputation that isn't based on faith alone, right? Like, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you when you do X, Y, and Z good works, right? You could think of a imputation like that. That's not what Lutherans teach, obviously. I don't think any Protestants teach that, but um, there is a difference between imputation and faith alone. Obviously, Lutherans say, you know, you receive the imputation of Christ's righteousness through faith alone. And Catholics, we would deny that you receive the imputation of Christ's righteousness, but that's not because we deny faith alone, uh, at least not every version of faith alone. There is a good and Catholic version of faith alone. So when Robert Kuhn says that he doesn't think the fathers say it's faith alone, if what he means is he doesn't think the fathers teach uh, an extrinsic imputation by the alien of the alien righteousness of Christ to the believer as the formal cause of our justification, then I would agree with, with Robert Kuhn's about that. However, the fathers say that justification is by faith alone, specifically in uh, many places, um, not just it's by faith apart from works, um, not just it's by faith apart from good deeds in general, um, not just it's by faith apart from uh, deeds wrought in holiness of heart. Here I'm quoting several different explicit texts in the Fathers, but also the phrase itself, faith alone, in the context of good deeds in general, uh, is used throughout the Fathers. Um, so, uh, I mean, you can find that in Ambrose, in Augustine, in uh, Clement, in, um, well, Clement doesn't use faith alone, but uh, Chrysostom, John Chrysostom uh, has faith alone, Ambrose, Augustine, uh, Father Joseph Fitzmaier has a commentary on Romans um, that's very good, and he lists all the people uh, pre-Luther, uh, at least all the significant people pre-Luther who use the phrase faith alone. Okay, so I want to get that out, out first, and then... Um, Second in the debate, um, Dr. Cooper said that all of the unique pieces of Lutheran justification can be found in the Fathers. And I want to talk about that as well, because I do agree with him to an extent. Um, you will hear things about the great exchange uh, in the Fathers, in the Epistle of Diognetus to Mathetes, um, the, uh, all the unrighteous for one righteous. And there's this sweet exchange of his righteousness for our unrighteousness. That's in the Fathers. Um, the phrase faith alone, as we've talked about, um, during Chrysostom's homilies on Romans and Galatians are great. And he uses that phrase several times. Um, not by deeds of holiness of heart, that you're not justified by works done in grace, you know, uh, that's in Clement, first Clement, you know, one of the first popes of the church says that. So that, that piece of Lutheran justification is in the fathers. And, you know, the idea that Christ is our righteousness, at least that language in that idea, generally speaking, is absolutely in the fathers. And even in uh, Catholic theology today, um, especially Bernard of Clairvaux in the medieval times, um, he had a great impact. He was a big impact on Luther and um, Bernard of Clairvaux spoke that way. Um, and that's partly where Luther got it from. Um, so Christ as our righteousness. Um, and seeing works of the law, not just as good works in general, but even seeing the problem with works of the law as being you're trying to earn salvation, right? That's one debate that goes on is what were the Jews trying to do? Or what is Paul trying to attack when he says, you know, you're not just five more works of the law. Uh, is it you, they were trying to earn salvation. Well, you know, in Ambrose uh, sees it that way. In Ambrose, I believe it's in his work on Joseph or Jacob. He says that the, uh, the brothers were trying to prove a case. 
um, I guess it would be on Joseph. Um, they were trying to prove a case and he, uh, and not just receive a gift. And he cites Galatians 2 as they were trying to establish their self with their good works. Um, so seeing it that way, all those things can be found in the fathers. Absolutely. I agree with Dr. Cooper about that as well. Uh, so now they get into, uh, in the debate, uh, Dr. Cooper and uh, uh, Dr. Coons uh, talk about uh, Romans 4. And I was pleased that Dr. Coons agrees that Romans 4 is not just about works of Torah, but that it's also about works in general, that Paul has rel uh, generalized to that point, because Paul clearly does. Even if you think the text is about Torah, uh, when Paul makes this uh analogy or metaphor about wage earning, uh, clearly that's a general principle. You know, justification is not like a wage that you earn. Um, so uh, Robert Coons agrees with that, uh, contra the new perspective and those who take the sort of new perspective route. Um, however, uh, Dr. Coons wants to limit um, the good works that Paul is talking here about to uh, works of the unregenerate, which is the uh, approach that St. Augustine would take. Um, now, I do think there's merit to that, although Dr. Cooper has a good point that Abraham in this text has already been justified previously to that point where Paul says, well, what has Abraham found? Was he uh, justified by works or by faith? Well, he doesn't say, was he justified by works or by faith? But that's the question he's asking. He says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Uh, well, that text he's citing from Genesis is after Abraham has already given his life over to the Lord and followed the Lord and, and been obeying the Lord, believing in the Lord for a while. So the context here is not about um, initial justification and excluding works prior to justification, excluding the works of the unregenerate. Uh, it seems to be much more uh, broad than that because we're talking about Abraham after he had already converted and given his life over to the Lord and walking with the Lord uh, for a while. So that would seem to indicate that Paul is talking more generally here about any kind of work, including like the deeds wrought in holiness of heart, which uh, Dr. Cooper will mention as well in this debate that uh, St. Clement talks about in his um, epistle to the Corinthians. Now, um, Coons, Dr. Coons does make a point that in this text, in Romans 4, um, Paul is talking about uh, the fact that you cannot earn salvation in the, sex, in the sense of uh, strictly merit. You cannot put God in your debt. You cannot strictly merit. You cannot earn in that sense. Um, and I think that's a good point. Um, Paul's saying that um, you cannot strictly merit um, righteousness or salvation. And because that's the case, um, Paul can be talking about deeds done in grace here. He said, the um, no deeds whatsoever, not even deeds done in grace, uh, can merit salvation in the sense of strict merit. Um, so I think um, what Dr. Coons had admitted there, what he had agreed with, what he had said, uh, was sufficient to go ahead and give Dr. Cooper much of what he wanted, uh, which I think is probably the right interpretation of this text, which is that Paul is emphasizing one side of the dialectic of salvation. Uh, and I want to talk about the dialectic here in a second, which is that you can't earn it. You can't merit it. Nothing you do, period, not even your own holiness of heart, anything like that can contribute. This is always a gift. It's never something you earn. And uh, that can apply to deeds done in grace as well, because deeds done in grace do not strictly merit salvation. They cannot. Um, so when we are talking about salvation, um, there are two sides to this coin. Um, and this, they didn't really touch on this in the debate. And, and I don't hear this touched on very often or at all, is that... Uh, in the Bible, there are two sides to this coin. On the one side, justification is a free gift given by God, impossible for the human to achieve or merit or earn or attain or acquire in any way by any kind of work. Um, and in the entire Christian life from start to finish, it's always a free gift of grace received by faith, by the love of the Father, and not because we've earned it or because we deserve it. Uh, that faith alone, start to finish, that's one side of the, of the dialectic. The other side of the dialectic that scripture also talks about and frames salvation in this way is that salvation is something you're going to have to earn by denying yourself 
and doing good and persevering to the end. That's a, that is one side of the coin. And both of those are true in a sense. So the, the first way is true uh, in the sense that you, know, you cannot merit salvation. You cannot strictly earn salvation. There's nothing you can ever do to, to, to acquire it. Um, you cannot uh, ascend into heaven. You cannot give yourself the Holy Spirit. And God, in his love and in his mercy, despite the fact that we've sinned, uh, wants to give us this as a free gift. Absolutely. And it's always a free gift throughout our entire life as Christians. Uh, and faith alone suffices throughout our entire life as, as Christians. And I'll get to that here in a second. Um, and the other side of this is that I'm a sinner. I have desires for sinful things. I have concupiscence. Even as a regenerate person, I have concupiscence, uh, tendencies and desires for sin. And to be saved, I will have to deny myself. And when I want to deny myself, and start living for the Lord and doing good, even if I got, even if in that moment I instantly lost every single desire for sin, well, guess what? I'm gonna have a lot of attacks from demons. I'm gonna have persecution in the world. I'm gonna have to suffer. All that stuff are things I'm gonna have to do. And if I do those things, I'll merit salvation. I have to do those things to merit salvation. Uh, it's not a free gift in the sense of uh, it doesn't cost me anything. It costs me everything. The cost of discipleship is high. It costs me my whole life. Um, I have to deny myself, deny my desires, do what God wants me to do, not what I want to do. And if I do those things, and if I suffer per through persecution, then I'll receive salvation as a reward. But I'll merit it. I'll earn it, in a sense. Um, and the way these two dialectics work together is distinctions between strict merit, condign merit, between a reward based on grace, between putting God in your debt. You know, th those kind of distinctions. Um are vital to understanding these two sides of this dialectic. And in some texts in Paul, Paul's just emphasizing the one side of that dialectic. And in other, side, in other texts of Paul, Paul will talk about the other side of the dialectic. You'll reap what you sow. Uh, things like that Paul will talk about. Uh, and it's a mistake as Catholics um, to try to explain away the, the text like Romans 3 and 4, where Paul's talking about that side of the, the, the dialectic, because that side is actually absolutely true. Where you go in error is if you say only that side of the dialectic is true, or only this side of the dialectic is true. You have both of them, and they're both true in a sense. Um, and they're both fully Catholic. Um, now, some Catholic theologians... Uh, will say that, will agree with much of what I've said in terms of initial justification. They'll say, look, faith alone um, is, is the only thing that can justify us when it comes to initial justification. However, once you're initially justified, good works are required for the final judgment, and then they'll play a role in, in which you merit final judgment. Now, there's a sense in which that's true, Absolutely. Um, good works definitely can contribute to final justification in that sense of good works done in grace can be rewarded, will be rewarded with salvation. Um, however, faith alone suffices for final justification and final judgment. Why is that the case? Well, um, if faith alone is understood as these Catholic, Catholic theologians would want it to be understood in terms of initial justification, because what would a Catholic theologian say initially justifies us faith, in terms of faith alone? Well, it has to be contrition. You have to repent. You have to place your trust in Christ. The sacraments are normally involved. You receive an infusion of grace, of love, of hope, of charity. Um, that's the faith of loan they're talking about. It is, I have a repentant trust in Christ. That is what initially justifies. They will say, yes, that kind of faith alone, initial justification, the only thing that can cause it. After that, though, you'll have to do good deeds, um, and, and those things will play a part in your final judgment. So they'll say that for that reason, faith alone doesn't suffice or isn't, isn't accurate when it comes to uh, continued justification from final judgment. However, uh, what they're missing in that presentation of Catholic doctrine is the fact that the, the initial justification uh, by faith alone, that kind of faith will always suffice. Because what kind of faith is it? It's a faith, faith that has love, that has contrition, that has sanctifying grace. And if that's what we're talking about when we mean faith alone, that you actually repent and trust Christ, then that always suffices for final justification, for continued justification at every point in the Christian life. There would never be a time in a, in a Catholic's life where I have sanctifying grace, I have contrition, and God will say, well, you haven't done enough works yet, so you're losing that. 
or, or you show up on judgment day before God, you die. And, uh, oh, shoot, I got TikTok notifications going on. Uh, so you, you show up on judgment day before God and you died with, with repentant trust in Christ. But he says, but you don't got the works to go with it. No, 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 no. That's not Catholic dogma. If you have the right kind of faith, that alone will always suffice for continued justification and final justification. Um, absolutely will suffice. Um, so that's important to point out. Uh, also, um, even though it's true that uh, good works can contribute and will contribute to final judgment, uh, and so it, if they're done in grace, uh, and so that it's incorrect to say that faith alone is the only thing that can cause final justification. Um, however, it, it's true and important to emphasize that the disposition, the pastoral, spiritual disposition of faith alone, in which I'm not trusting in myself, I'm coming before God with empty hands, looking to him alone, asking him to, uh, to look at my faith alone and not my works, uh, the, that disposition is always absolutely required of the Catholic throughout their whole life. It's not as if now I'm in grace, I can start trusting in the deeds I've done in grace. No, 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 no. The the faith alone disposition, the empty hand of faith, absolutely required. And you can see this in Catholic dogma. Um, you can the catechism, which quotes uh, St. Therese, uh, where she says, at the end of this life, I'll come before you empty handed. Um, she's a sister, you know, a nun in, in grace, talking about her works that she's doing in grace. She's saying, I'll come before you empty handed. Um, the Council of Trent says, God forbid a man trust in himself. And that's a general principle of the Council of Trent's laying down for Catholics in grace and people out of grace. Never trust in yourself. Always trusting in God's mercy alone. Um, and, you know, the fact that you're not, you're not in grace because of what you've done. All of these things are, you know, absolutely essential to the, uh, to the disposition, uh, which we can call the faith alone disposition throughout the entire Christian life. So, I want to do this little video talk about these things, uh, important things, the dialectic. Some texts are faith alone. Some texts are earn it by your good works. We hold those two together with distinctions between things like um, strict merit, condign merit, reward based on grace, something you're doing to put God in your debt or something you do that did put God in your debt, those kind of distinctions. And um, so thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for watching. Go ahead and check out Sue Ansona's channel. If you watch this, Intellectual Conservatism, he has good stuff on there. All right. Love you guys.